Before we start, a warning. This episode contains descriptions of killing and torture and the sounds of a terror attack right from the start. From the Times and the Sunday Times, this is The Story. I'm Manveen Rana. On Friday night, terrorists entered a concert hall near Moscow and opened fire. The shots were not sporadic. They were constant volleys of gunfire. We all got up and tried to move the whole... At the time of recording, 137 people have been killed and many more injured, with some still in a critical condition. President Putin has repeatedly blamed Ukraine and even the West for the attack in Moscow. The question immediately arises, who benefits from this? This atrocity can only be a link in a whole series of attempts by those who have been at war with our country since 2014 by the hands of the neo-Nazi Kyiv regime. But despite the war in Ukraine and Russia's antagonism towards the West, all the evidence points to the attackers coming from an unexpected quarter. A network from the terror organization Islamic State. The story today, who are Islamic State Khorasan and why have they attacked Russia? I'm Mark Galliotti. I'm an honorary professor at University College London and the director of the consultancy Mayak Intelligence. Mark, take us back to Friday night. Just describe what was happening in a concert hall near Moscow. Yes, it was one of the sort of largest and, and swankiest of the various music venues, just on, on the outskirts of Moscow in this little commuter town. So there's this place called the Crocus City Mall. And there, well, anything up to about 7,000 people were gathering for a rock concert by the group Picnic, when, of course, things took a rather abrupt and dark turn. When did the attack start? And just talk us through what we know of what happened. Well, what we know is that shortly before the performance was about to start, about four gunmen stormed in. There were security guards around, but they were essentially unarmed stewards rather than anything else. And the gunmen just started firing straight away. They rushed through the foyer into the main auditorium, which by that point was uh, maybe about a quarter full. And there, again, they just started gunning people down indiscriminately, while at the same time using canisters of what looked like gasoline to set a series of fires. And for about 20 minutes, they rampaged through the venue. Obviously, people, you know, some were frozen in place, some fled, some just panicked. And then after about 20 minutes, before the emergency services had arrived, they piled out, got into a car and drove off. And looking at the security footage, I mean, it's such an eerie scene because they seem so calm. Yes, I mean, essentially, it's as if they're just wandering through, I mean, almost as if they're playing a computer game. And in some cases, making sure that people who were down were actually killed rather than just simply faking death or, or wounded. I mean, these are people who are definitely out to kill and, and to get the highest uh, tally, shall we say, of victims possible. It's horrifying. We now have extra footage of the night, and that came directly from Islamic State and the Khorasan who released this footage. Where does this footage come from and, and what can you see? Well, I mean, like all footage from the time, it, it, it's a little bit sort of confused. Some have suggested that this is stuff which could have been up on social media, that, you know, victims essentially posted and that Khorasan grabbed and appropriated for themselves. It, it's still not very clear. But again, you know, what this shows is that, to be honest, from, from a terrorist point of view, these kind of attacks 
precisely because they are that, they're terrorist attacks, it's not just about how many people you kill and how much property you destroy. It's actually about the informational impact, the degree to which you can you know, kill 130-odd people but terrify a country of over 100 million people with the subsequent footage. Not everyone will have seen that footage. Is it even more brutal than we'd, we'd thought? Yeah, I really wouldn't advise it of anyone. I mean, there is footage that I have felt I had to watch just because, unfortunately, this, this is my bread and butter. But uh, unless you really get your kicks out of watching innocent people being gunned down, which I hope none yeah. of your, your listeners do, I, I'd no. advise you not to. And just stepping back, I mean, put this in context for us. In terms of recent Russian history, just how bad is this terrorist attack? Oh, this is, this is catastrophic. I mean, this is basically the worst for a couple of decades. There has been a regular tally of terrorist attacks, some associated with Islamic terrorism coming out of the North Caucasus region, where the Russians suppressed um, Chechen attempts at independence in two very bloody wars. But increasingly, they're coming from, frankly, Central Asia and Central Asians. In most cases, though, exactly, the terrorism is associated with extreme jihadist movements. But although there have been occasional mass terrorist outrages, particularly the so-called Beslan case back in 2004, of late, it's tended to be rather more small-scale. And it's not the sort of stuff which, frankly, on the whole in the West we hear about. But this is absolutely, again, I said, for the moment, it was thoroughly shocking for, obviously, everyone, but particularly the Russians, because they thought that this kind of mass killing has really been relegated to the past. Yeah. And, you know, as you say, this is a catastrophic attack. At what point do we see President Putin coming out after the attack? Yes, it's interesting. It has to be said that Putin, for all his attempts at building this kind of macho persona, when he's faced with a crisis, he does tend to hide behind the sofa. Apparently, three times the TV networks on that fateful evening and, and night were told to stand by for a presidential address to the country. Three times they were stood down. It actually took over 18 hours before he finally delivered a you know, five-minute or so address to the country, which I have to say was pretty lackluster. <laughs> Regarding the investigation of this crime and results of operational search actions, I can now say the following. All four of the actual performers of the act of terror, all those who shot and killed people were found and detained. They tried to hide and were moving in the direction of Ukraine. There, according to preliminary data, they had a crossing of the border prepared from the Ukrainian side. He didn't once mention Islamic State. He just simply raised this, frankly, rather implausible suggestion of a Ukrainian connection. He made some ritual genuflections to feeling the pain of the nation. And he made some equally ritual threats that those people who are behind it will feel the wrath of Russia. But essentially, it felt, and it's, again, this is someone who, who's seen a lot of Putin's addresses, it felt very much as if he was, to use the expression, phoning it in. There wasn't really much that was there. And dipping into Russian social media after the address, it was really quite striking how underwhelmed many Russians were too. This was really? a, a crucial moment. This was his moment to actually, firstly, address the sense amongst his own people that, frankly, he's become disconnected from them. Mm. And also his chance to play to his sort of classic macho persona. And to be honest, he failed at both. Afterwards, he didn't even go out immediately to go and you know, visit the victims or the site. He simply went and sort of had a little photo opportunity in the chapel of his out-of-town residence at Novo Ogaryova. It was left to, for example, the mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sabyanin, to go and visit the wounded in hospital. And again, looking at social media, you know, they... People admired that. They, they, they thought that's exactly what a leader should be doing. You put yourself out there. Putin always seems to be terrified of being associated with things going wrong. Time and time again, we, we have seen Putin very hesitant to actually get involved, very hesitant to not just emote with his people, 
And to a degree, he could get away with it when he had other assets and his legitimacy was based on the fact that most Russians were living good lives and such like. Hmm. These days, though, I mean, he's just essentially awarded himself this entirely implausible 87% vote in the presidential elections the weekend prior. On one level, frankly, a cynic could say, well, he may have felt he just didn't even need to bother. Wow. Just not even necessary. His system has lost its last vestige of being a genuine, I wouldn't say it was never really a true democracy, but it was on some level based on a degree of genuine legitimacy, a degree of reaching out to the masses and giving them what they wanted. Now we're just seeing this simply just become a, a common or garden authoritarianism. And as you say, in his address, you know, the one thing he did mention was hinting that Ukraine might have a role in this. That's been, you know, widely undermined by evidence put forward by Western intelligence. Talk us through how that's gone down in, in Russia. It's interesting because, yes, he, he made this broad claim. It's not that he's actually saying that Ukrainians are just outright behind it. He's actually suggesting, though, that there is a connection and that the terrorists, when they were apprehended, to basically to the southwest of Moscow, were heading towards Ukraine and that the Ukrainians were going to open up a window to allow them to flee into Ukraine. So there's a degree of collusion there. Well, what we're seeing is obviously the more lowbrow and high energy Russian news outlets are, of course, running with this quite heavily, saying Ukraine must be punished and so forth. And likewise, the, the usual sort of toxic cheerleaders and repeaters of Kremlin talking points on TV are, are saying some intemperate things. But what's really quite interesting to me is when one looks more at, shall I say, the professional commentators and observers, the people who actually know about security issues or who tend to be mouthpieces of the security apparatus, hmm. they're really playing this down. Um, really? And, and when you particularly find that you know, the, the, the four men who have been apprehended are the accused uh, terrorists and who, to be honest, do seem likely to have been the terrorists, all four of them are Tajiks from Central Asia. And I think, therefore, it, it becomes very hard to really sustain this idea that there's somehow this extraordinary conspiracy that unites radicals from Central Asia and the Ukrainian state. But nonetheless, yeah. Putin will, will give it a go. I think two reasons. One is he wants to demonize or continue to demonize the Ukrainians. But the second one is I think he's trying to actually play down the Central Asian dimension of this because that raises some, some dangerous policy dilemmas for him. Tell us about those. Russia depends on Central Asian migrant labor. There are millions of them currently in Russia, and they mm. do a lot of the hard physical work and, frankly, the work that Russians don't particularly want to do, or at least not for the salaries that people are willing to pay. So whether we're talking about clearing the snow off the streets or construction work or the like, Central Asians play a disproportionate role. And if we start to see the state turning against them, we'll probably have a kind of campaign, which if past campaigns are anything to go by, will be ugly and heavy-handed. You know, people being stopped in the streets for document checks and searches and everything mm. else. And Central Asians will, will be made to feel even less welcome than they are now. And so the fear from Russia is precisely that in the name of satisfying a population that wants to see action, you might end up driving out of the country the people who are necessary. Because at the moment, between the needs of the war and also the demands of keeping the defense industries running basically 24-7, there's actually a labor shortage. This would hit the war effort itself because it would hit the capacity to continue to produce the military goods that are needed if Central Asian labor was taken out of Russia's market. So this is why I think Putin is, is reluctant to actually address what is the real cause, which is Islamic State Khorasan. So, Mark, you've been explaining how for President Putin, he's very keen for this not to be seen as an Islamic State attack. He'd much rather try and blame Ukraine. Stepping back, though, you know, I think for a lot of people, when this attack happened, they'd sort of put Islamic State in the past. It was sort of a historic organisation. Just tell us a bit about Islamic State in, in the Khorasan, who they are, where they come from, and how different they are to the caliphate that, you know, everybody talked about a few years ago. 
yes, I mean, if only Islamic State would indeed disappear just because we, we stopped thinking about it. No, I mean, what's clear is that you know, Islamic State is no longer the single structured organization that it once aspired to be. And instead, what we have are a whole collection of affiliates of, for want of a better word, franchises that one finds around the world. Islamic State of Khorasan province, as it's more formally known, is the affiliate that essentially occupies Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia. And they operate in fairly wild and woolly regions where it's a lot easier to actually maintain your training camps and your arsenals and so forth. But also, for them, Russia is a much closer and more immediate crusader threat, as they call them. Because as far as they're concerned, the Russians, they, they suppressed jihadism in the North Caucasus. They supported the regime of Bashir al-Assad in Syria, fighting a, a variety of different rebel groups, but Islamic State being one of them. And also, Russia is an ally and a supporter of a variety of regimes in Central Asia, that, again, quite brutally suppresses jihadism within their borders. So, you know, from all their points of view, Russia is not just a legitimate target, but a favoured target. And therefore, they continue to launch attacks. This is the, the most serious, but they've had at least six successful terrorist attacks in about the last equal number of years. The last serious one that, that, that got through was actually a bombing on the St. Petersburg metro carried out by one specific individual that killed, oh, from memory, I think it was 15 people. That was back in 2017. So again, these attacks aren't that common in terms of, you know, sizable civilian deaths. But on the other hand, there is a, a regular sort of small-scale series of attacks that, that do take place. But as I say, they don't tend to be newsworthy within Russia, let alone in, in the outside world. But what they do show is that Islamic State Khorasan when it's focusing on Russia, and remember, it's also very active also in places like Pakistan, but when it's involved in Russia, you know, it, it clearly has some kind of a support base, and it also has a very strong axe or scimitar to grind. And what exactly is the sort of the strategy behind their attacks? What is it they're trying to achieve? I mean, I think the, the honest answer is actually strategy takes second place to opportunism. I think there is a general sense that, first of all, it is a moral duty and religious duty to actually strike blows against the Crusaders. Secondly, there is a sense that if you do that, then there is a chance that you destabilize their regimes and create new opportunities, because the ultimate goal is clearly to establish caliphates, territorial units. But as I said, as long as the Russian state is strong and united, that's very difficult. And the third goal is precisely to essentially trigger some kind of counterproductive backlash. I mean, this, this is a little bit like when you go back to the 1970s and the communist terrorist organizations in Europe, the Red Brigades, the bader meinhof group, their goal was what they called fascistification. They thought that they could kill and bomb their way to forcing Western governments to become these vicious fascist regimes which would turn the working class against them. Well, so too, Islamic State Khorasan is actually in some ways hoping to needle Putin into the kind of backlash against Muslims who represent 10%, after all, of Russia's permanent population, hmm. or the wider Central Asian population, to precisely basically act as their best recruiting sergeant. We've also seen them attacking Iran and Turkey and attempting attacks in Germany recently. Is that all sort of for a similar reason? It is really. I mean, again, I think the degree to which they have internalised this sense that these attacks are a, a religious duty. We have a tendency to assume that somehow there is a sort of a strategy and someone says, we, we will now attack this country or this particular target. It tends to be more the other way around. You get someone who is radicalised, who wants to carry out an attack, and maybe gathers other people around them, and who has the opportunity, maybe they have access to weapons or whatever, then you unleash them when you can. So, you know, we shouldn't try and, in some ways, join the dots up too closely, thinking that there's something. It is more exactly that it's essentially an ideology of terrorist attack. And Mark, how different is this to the Islamic State 
a few years ago, you know, when they actually had a caliphate and they had a territory. Is this a more or less dangerous version? Yeah, it's always one of the big dilemmas, really. I mean, on one level, it's less dangerous in the sense of, you know, when when the Islamic State actually had territory under its control, it was able to operate on a, on a totally different order of magnitude. We found them being involved in all kinds of often criminal acts like uh, oil smuggling, which meant that they had a lot of money, which meant that they could buy a certain kind of weapons and raise armies and such like. So that was a particular type of threat. But it was also the particular type of threat, frankly, that everyone else is best able to cope with. You know, there are other people who had bigger and better armies, quite frankly. Now that in some ways that's been shattered and it's just simply become this widespread network of affiliates and this ideology of struggle, each individual attack is, generally speaking, going to be much, much less dramatic and dangerous. I mean, we should recognize that this Crocus City attack is very much an outlier. But on the other hand, it also makes it so much harder to actually deal with, let alone eliminate the threat, because there is no single leader, there is no single command structure with whom you can either reach a deal with or alternatively take them out and see the whole unit wither. It's cellular, it's often highly secretive, and it is unfortunately constantly being regenerated by the grievances of people who often, frankly, do have many very real grievances to feel, and somehow they can decide to blame it on the Crusaders. And for Russia, you know, looking ahead, this, this problem hasn't completely gone away. They've managed to arrest the people who committed the attack on Friday. What do we know about what's happened to them? Well, I mean, I think we've, we have seen the worst instincts of the Russian security state on show in that, yes, they have been arrested. And again, until it's, it's proven, we don't know for sure, but th there is a lot of corroborative evidence to suggest that these are indeed the gunmen. But on the other hand, I mean, we have seen videos of one of them with part of his ear being cut off by a Russian special forces soldier and, and that part put in his mouth. We've seen another man who clearly had his genitals wired up to an electrical car battery. We have someone who, from the look of it, faced uh, attempted sort of asphyxiation with a plastic bag on his head. And look, we knew that the Russian security officers used torture. But to actually video it and then publicize those videos, it's really quite an extraordinary sign of, I would say, the, the debasement of late Putinism. From his point of view, it's going to be almost impossible for him not to either underreact and leave people dissatisfied or overreact and run the risk precisely of everything kind of running out of control, Central Asians being driven out of the country and greater problems at home. This is unquestionably bad news for Vladimir Putin. And Mark, beyond Russia, how is the rest of Europe reacting? Because, you know, having watched this catastrophic attack happen in Moscow, there must be a sense that this could happen in any capital. There is, but I think, again, look, and I mean, Britain in many ways knows it better than, than many countries, given its long experience of having to deal with terrorism, first related to Ireland, and then later on more sort of jihadist versions, is you've got to recognise that sometimes the terrorists are going to get through doesn't matter what kind of, of security engine you've got to try and defend them. Sometimes they're going to get lucky. And if you take this case in particular, you know, it clearly didn't involve some kind of massive long-term conspiracy. It was not like 9-11. It was basically four guys with Kalashnikovs and a getaway car. They clearly had allies around them, maybe videoing them, maybe stashing the weapons in the venue in advance for them or whatever. But essentially, this was not a big operation. So it's a lot harder to actually sort of penetrate and identify those. So from the point of view of the counterterrorism professionals in the West, this is just an object case of what you need to be looking out for, the kind of worst case scenario that you're preparing for. But does it tell us that Islamic State in one form or another is back. It never really went away.
That was our resident Russia expert, Mark Galliotti. If you want to learn more, do check out the long Q&A he did on the terrorist attack at thetimes.co.uk. This episode was produced by Taryn Siegel. The executive producer was Fiona Leach, and sound design and theme tune are by Mao Lissetto. If you have any thoughts on what you've just heard or any ideas for future episodes, do get in touch at the story at thetimes.co.uk. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. <laughs>